Hello and welcome to Dear Hank and John. Or as I prefer to think of it, Dear John and Hank. It's a comedy podcast about death where my brother John and I will answer your questions, we'll give you dubious advice, and we'll bring you all the week's news from both Mars and AFC Wimbledon. The AFC Wimbledon news this week. Hank, it is a big, yeah. big, big Big AFC Wimbledon big news week. week. The biggest one yeah, ever. And I, uh, I, you're just going to have to wait, though, all of you people listening, to the end of the podcast. Because we can't tell you. We have to do all the question stuff, which I know is the boring stuff that nobody's here for. They're really all just here for the AFC Wimbledon news. John... I actually think that this week they will be pretty pleased and surprised and excited about the AFC Wimbledon it's, news. It's pretty, it's pretty freaking cool. Um, but, uh, but, but first, I have to ask you, John... How are you doing? I'm doing great entirely because of the AFC Wimbledon news that for some reason I'm not allowed to talk about until the end of the podcast. Um, <laughs> I have thought about nothing else all day. Uh, how are you? I believe you. I'm good. I'm in Los Angeles. Uh, it's actually a little chilly, but I, I do like it chilly, so I'm not complaining. And I've gotten to see so many cool people in the last two weeks. Uh, I'm just so pleased to be a part of, of this, uh, this community of creators and, uh, and I just think it's so fascinating, and I love talking to them, and I'm just such a fanboy, and um, it's, such, it's so cool to be both a fanboy and a creator, and for people to, like, uh, to want to talk to me, uh, even though I'm, yeah. I'm mostly just, uh, just am a fan. And they're like, well, let's have a conversation about, it, it'll be useful to both of us. And I'm like, yeah, sure, I'm sure it will, but really I just want to talk about how great you are and, and how, I like, how I like the content you make. So it's been really fun, and I, I, I'm going to make at least two videos out of the stuff that I've collected while I'm here, and I'm excited for both of them. Well, I am thrilled for the fact that you're in Los Angeles on my behalf so that I don't have to be there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are lots of bad parts about it, uh, mostly the getting from one place to another. You know, I thought that it was that the traffic in L.A. was bad, but it's really just that it's gigantic. Uh, the, the traffic can actually be quite good, but it still takes a for, like 45 minutes to get somewhere because it's just a very big place. Also, the traffic is terrible. Would you like a short poem for the day? Yeah, tell me all about it. I thought I would read you another uh, haiku by Richard Wright, actually. I like the last Richard Wright haiku so much, and I like this one so much. Written right at the end of his life, uh, when he was living in exile in Paris, he wrote, Burning out its time and timing its own burning, one lonely candle oh yes just a beautiful little haiku yeah i like about it. the end of life that was great yeah. high quality i know you, that richard wright you know he could he could do a lot of different things great nonfiction writer great novelist and turns out a pretty darn good haiku writer i i know nothing about this person what do you mean you don't know anything about richard wright of course you know something about richard wright what do i know about him uh, i mean i <laughs> I'm Googling I'm right now. I'm fairly certain that you read a Richard Wright novel in high school, like Native Son or his memoir, Black Boy. I'm pretty positive that every American high school student has to read at least one Richard Wright book. Well, I will say uh, that despite uh, what I may have been required to read in high school, I didn't read all of those books. All right. Well, let's just answer some questions from our listeners before I start getting mad at you for all the things that you haven't read. All right. We got a lot of good questions here, John. Do you want to start with a fun one or a serious one? Fun. Oh, John, mm -hmm. this may be my favorite Dear Hank and John question of all time. It's from Sam, who asks, Dear Hank and John, I work at Subway. And sometimes I worry about the health of my customers, especially children. I assuage this by giving customers light mayonnaise when they don't specify what kind of mayonnaise they want or giving them far more spinach than lettuce when they ask for both. Is it wrong of me to sneak these healthier options into customers' sandwiches if they don't know about it? Wow, that's a great question. I do not know how to feel about you, Sam. You're a little, you're a little sneaky, I, uh, a little sneaky Subway sandwich artist, Hank, Sam. as you know, my wife uh, is also a former Subway employee. We, aren't um, you also a former I, Subway employee? I was never a Subway employee. I think that you're, you're mixing it up. I'm a frequent Subway customer. <laughs> um, okay, okay. It's a common mistake. <laughs> uh, but I will also say, John, that I, I am a frequent Subway customer. And in fact, the, uh, the guy who, Ethan, who works at my Subway, uh, he may, I'm pretty sure he's a fan, so he may be listening right now. Hello, Ethan, if you're out there. I have to say that 
uh, a well-made Subway sandwich is so much better than a poorly made Subway sandwich that first off, I value mm -hmm. Sam's seriousness about his work. I also value the fact that he uses more spinach than lettuce, even though spinach is more expensive. Um, I don't know if mm -hmm, his manager mm -hmm. has told him that, but the manager at my Subway definitely has. Um, <laughs> and I don't think if, if if there are no specific requests for kind of mayonnaise, I think it's fine to use light mayonnaise uh, if you think that's the I better mayonnaise oh, yeah. for the sandwich. I don't, I don't know that I agree, and I, John. I think it's fine to use more spinach if you think that's better for the right. sandwich. I don't think that, Sam, that it is your place to make other people's health yes. decisions. Uh, I think that I think that the light mayonnaise at Subway and the mayonnaise mayonnaise at Subway are not even close to the same thing. If I ask for mayonnaise, I know what I'm asking for, and it is not the light mayonnaise, which is a very different thing. I'm looking up. It's like, it's like, uh, it's like I took, it's, if I, it's like if I asked for mayonnaise and they gave me ketchup. They are that different really? to me. They are, they are deeply, or like ranch dressing instead of, instead of mayonnaise. It's just not Okay, the same. light mayonnaise has 50 calories and five grams of fat. Mayonnaise, regular mayonnaise, has, oh my, 110 calories yes. and 12 grams of fat. So it really isn't the same thing. No, it is not. And, uh, and also, it is a fairly significant contribution to the health of your customer. But, uh, and maybe it's okay to, to, like, you can sort of feign the fact that you made a mistake if they come back and they're like, what did you do? And then you have to throw the sandwich away. And, but if, if, it's a child, if it's a child especially, they probably aren't going to be able to tell because children have just notoriously uh, no, no uh, connection with reality. I, I do not understand them at all. But uh, I, I do think that it is somewhat problematic to be uh, sort of, yeah, b b making the health choices of other people uh, for them. Uh, and I, I think that... Right. I mean, to use an extreme example, like uh, w without being their doctor, you, for instance, don't know if maybe they've been told that they need to get much, much more fat into their diet for some reason. Um, so I, I think that uh, obviously that's unlikely, but it's not impossible. So I don't think it's... Uh, your place to make other people's uh, health decisions, or in fact, to judge their to judge the food that they're eating. Right, right. No, yeah, and and I it, I do like that's sort of my bigger problem with this is like like the the way that we judge other people for the way that they eat uh, is yeah. I think problematic. But if somebody asks for spinach and you give them more. They can always take it off, but I don't think many people wouldn't complain about having more spinach on their Subway sandwich. In fact, usually I am uh, I'm wondering why I got so little. So I'm, yeah, I'm I always totally have to guiltily for ask for more. Yeah. I've actually started to offer an extra quarter in exchange for a, a proper amount of spinach. <laughs> All right, Hank, our next question comes from Janine, who asks, Dear John and Hank, despite my university having a strict honor code, a lot of students cheat on homework and tests. Mm. On the one hand, I know these students are missing out on getting the most of their educations. But on the other hand, their cheating hurts me because class grades are often curved depending on class averages, especially if I won't be able to directly apply what I'm learning outside of an academic setting, how could I come to terms with people around me getting higher grades than I do when they aren't grappling with the material? Do they deserve these high grades if they can successfully cheat and not get caught? Am I just a sucker for not figuring out how to play the system? Mm. So let me submit that you are asking many different questions mm -hmm. uh, that have different answers. Are you a sucker for not figuring out how to play the system? No, they are suckers for spending money on a college education that is not educating them. Yes. Do they deserve these high grades if they can successfully cheat? Of course they don't deserve the high grades. Um, how can I come to terms with people around me getting higher grades than I do when they aren't grappling with the material? I would answer that question by saying that uh, grades don't actually matter very much and grappling with the material matters a lot. So yeah. to me, that's how you come to terms with it. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that it's yeah. your moral obligation to turn those people in. No, I agree with that. But I also think that like we have this structure in our education system that makes us think that the grade is the most important thing. And in a lot of ways it is, uh, but, but mostly on the way to university does it matter. Mostly it's, a, uh, like, it's, it's like judging you to, to make sure that you are placed into, uh, into university and can get scholarships if you need them. 
But uh, once, once you're there, this is, this is not about the letter that you end up with at the end of the semester. This is about no. learning and being, uh, being a better person and, and, and gaining that knowledge and insight. And I, I think that it's, it's more important that you struggle and that you, you, know, you even maybe talk to your professor about like, the success and perils of your struggle and, like, and, and you know, depending on what you're studying, of course, this is all very different stuff. But um, the, uh, like the, the, the knowledge of and the connection between, you know, you and your professors is going to be, you know, just by the virtue of, of like you progressing and struggling is going to be, you know, more significant than your peers who are just coasting uh, and, and, you know, using whatever tools they can to get that letter bigger. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, the letter is, I mean, as someone who hires a lot, I yeah. just don't buy the argument that the letter no. is very important. I just don't think GPAs no. are very important. I think where you go to college is like slightly important. I think what you study is slightly important. Um, but I think in the end it's about skill sets and, you know, and being able to contextualize yourself and understand social cues and work in teams and lots of things that, frankly, college isn't very focused on in most yeah, cases. Yeah, I've never looked at a GPA while hiring. Ever, ever, ever. I have no idea if any of these people even graduated from college, to be honest with yeah, you. Yeah, I was recently surprised to find that one of one of the, maybe the highest person at our company who isn't me and John, uh, I, don't, I don't believe graduated from college and one of the highest people didn't graduate from high school right i mean i think that there is kind of an equivalent experience uh category yeah uh, when it comes to applying for jobs that said i still think that it's best to go to college and and complete it in in the vast majority mm -hmm. of cases yeah absolutely and the statistics are with me although less and less each year um as college becomes less and less reasonable but uh but yeah, in terms of its cost, you mean by reasonable, uh, less and less reasonable by cost. Yes, I, I think that it is it remains reasonable in terms of uh, valuing <laughs> reason. <laughs> All right, Hank, we have another question. This is from Catherine. She writes, Dear John and Hank, in 2009, John made a video about the stimulus plan that was going to be signed into action by the president on February 16th of that same year. I was wondering, how has this affected us? Has it worked? Has it hurt or helped us? What has happened since then? It's a great question. Oh, God, I, I don't know. I, I do. You, answer, you, you know, you tell me, John. You tell me. Okay. So it is very hard to yes. find economists who do not acknowledge that the stimulus plan, which was called the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009, was a success in the sense that it probably uh, lowered the basement of the recession. Um, in fact, the stimulus plan uh, has been used in lots of conversations among economists since then as evidence for uh, the Keynesian economic model in which during recessions, governments uh, offset decreases in private spending by uh, increasing public spending. Uh, lots of economists have been like, look, it worked. It pretty clearly worked. This is as close as we can get to a real world uh, example of the Keynesian economic model working. Now, of course, the other side of the Keynesian economic model that governments spend less during periods of growth is the part that nobody wants to embrace, right? Like, because mm -hmm. that's the part where yeah. you have to be like, oh, things are going well, we're going to uh, spend less money and just keep it, in, you know, in a lockbox somewhere. So for when things aren't going well. Um, that's a little bit of an actually unfair oversimplification of Keynesian economic theory. And also, what a surprise. I should note that I am not an economist. Uh, I'm just, I was, however, the third best C student in economics <laughs> when I was in 11th grade at the Alabama State Academic Decathlon. So That's there's not that. That's not nothing. Um, did the stimulus work? Yes. Uh, obviously, it did not uh, immediately end the recession, but it probably made the recession suck less. Um, and there's a chance that if it hadn't been for the stimulus, the recession would have sucked so much worse that it would have led to a deflationary spiral, which would have led to a big, great 
depression like thing. Um, but, uh, it speaks to our short political and economic memory that almost no one ever talks about the 2009 stimulus anymore. And when we do talk about it, we talk about it as a thing that made a small impact because it was ultimately a pretty small impact, uh, one way or the other. So if the stimulus had failed, it would have failed in a minor way. And that the stimulus, and and that at least I think the stimulus succeeded, uh, but it succeeded in a minor way. And in general, that's the case for almost all of these like legislative initiatives that we fight and die over and say are going to save or ruin America, right? When we look back at them eight or nine years later, we think, well, that was a modest success or that was a modest failure. Like we look back at the Bush uh, Medicare uh, prescription drug plan and say, well, that was a modest failure. And we look back at Obamacare and say either I mean, I think either that's a modest success or that's a modest failure. I mean, the truth is not that many people are enrolled on the uh, exchange. It hasn't yeah. changed things that's, that that's much not for what that I tend many to hear. people. What I, so I just think a lot of times the stuff we fight over right. is the wrong, like it's stuff that's not going to be that important in the future. And what I mostly hear uh, in, in these conversations is Obamacare is a massive failure. <laughs> it's hard to say that Obamacare <laughs> is a massive who... failure when... No, I completely agree with you. I completely agree. But that is, it, it is, um, you know, in terms of what we want to talk about it, it, I think it often has more to do with uh, with how we want to, how we, how the people in the news media want to frame the issue because they want to frame the issue in a way that is good for the, the politics that they ascribe to. I, uh, yeah, I, I think I think that we uh, shouldn't get too caught up in this, John, but I I do like your answer. All right, well, then let's just move on. All right, I got a question from Renee who asks, Dear Hank and John, <laughs> now that we have established some armrest etiquette, I feel it's time to decide another one, drive throughs What are your thoughts on a threshold to decide whether a person needs to order inside or use the convenience of the drive through No more than three complicated Starbucks drinks? No minivans ordering for the family of six? Should they be treated like 10 items or less lanes at the grocery store? Oh, come on, Renee. You can't, you can't, you, you can't tell people how they're going to use the drive through Anybody can use the drive through if they want to. If they don't want to pull 8,000 kids out of their car seats and put them back in, that's fine. Get, you, if you want convenience, can get out of your car and go inside and have the shorter line in. I always feel like the drive through is the short, is the long option. The drive through always takes longer because it's people who don't want to get out of their cars. I'm going to go inside and talk to a person because uh, I like them. And I have strong opinions, apparently, on this. <laughs> I actually don't know which is longer, um, but I do know that if you have 17 kids, you should be allowed to use the drive through because anyone who's ever put one child in a car seat knows that the thought of <laughs> taking that child out of that yeah. car seat for five minutes to get food and then putting that child back in the car seat is so overwhelming <laughs> that I'll sit in a drive through line for three hours. The other day I was driving past an In-N-Out and I was like, I should get In-N-Out. I'm in L.A. And, uh, and the line was that long. And I was like, I'm going to go to McDonald's. <laughs> oh, where man. there was no line at all. I made sure to go to In-N-Out Burger on my way out of Los Angeles. It's always my way of saying goodbye to Los Angeles so I have a nice memory of it. I still haven't been to In-N-Out this trip. I need to figure out how to do that. We should do it today, Catherine. Yeah. Catherine's sitting right next to me. She's looking at me with these eyes mm. and she's, she's holding her hand to her mouth and making, making mouth motions. And now the whole hamburger's in there. The mimed hamburger is inside of my wife. Uh, I, think, I think we've settled this question very quickly and efficiently, John. Great. Let's go to the next one. Anonymous writes, Dear John and Hank, recently my partner of half a decade broke up with me out of the blue. Let's just start by saying that you're saying half a decade as a way of trying to like make it longer, uh, which I'm going to say more about in a second. He has been my best friend for the many years we were a couple. We lived together and talked all day. Now he has moved out and we have no contact. We've broken up and gotten back together before in the past, but I think this time is different. My friends all say that space and no contact now is the best thing in order to heal and to have a chance at friendship later. But actually taking this advice feels like the worst thing in the world. What should I do? Uh, I actually think that you should probably take your friend's advice, although I am very sympathetic to the fact that it is it truly probably does feel like the worst thing in the world. Um, there's an element of catastrophizing that accompanies any major trauma or major loss, like losing a, a relationship like this, um, because 
the people around you don't understand what a big deal it is, especially if you weren't married or if you didn't have, you know, like it's because it's not legally complicated. They think that it, it it's not emotionally complicated and that you sort of just need to kind of get over it. Um, but of course, that's very hard to do practically slash impossible. I mean, it hurts because it mattered. Uh, it hurts because it was important and uh, because there's a real profound loss there. But not acknowledging the loss is not a way forward. Uh, you have to let yourself grieve. You have to let yourself be inside of that that loss. And you have to know that it's okay. Not judge yourself for being sad or angry or whatever you feel. And because only through that process of grief are you going to get on the other side when it is no longer the worst thing in the world. Um, so I really think that at least in my experience, space and no contact is the way to sort of rebuild your life and go out with your friends, you know, have as much of a social life as you can handle. And you will find yourself slowly over the course of time rebuilding a life that doesn't include that person. And eventually you will probably, if you're anything like me, look back on it and be like, huh, sure. I'm glad that happened. Now that's no comfort now, but I, I, I do think that, um, uh, that sometimes it takes years, but you look back on, on your life and you feel grateful for, for the way things happened. I don't know. Maybe that's, hope. Maybe that's hope, too much hope. Just give you the little bit of hope that uh, going out and hanging out with your friends is a good thing mm -hmm. to do. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, uh, that's real rough. That's real rough. I have another hard question, John. Do you want another one? Great, Leo. Let's keep going. This one's from Gabby, who asks, Dear Hank and John, I received a sexual invitation from a 60-year-old former teacher a while ago. I am 17. I was quite oh. good friends with him. And I know him to be a very good man otherwise, but this thing made me so angry. I was angry that he felt attracted to me. I was angry that he expressed those feelings to me. Why am I so angry? Um, well, Gabby, I think that your anger is justified for a lot of different reasons. I think this is all tied up with uh, how, how you imagine this man as like a mentor and a friend, but, you know, obviously more of a, you know, a, an authority and a leadership figure rather than a peer. Um, and, uh, and you had an image of this guy as a good person in your mind, and he, he broke it, and he did that uh, with, he must have done it with the knowledge that it, that, that was the likely outcome. And I just can't, I can't imagine that in another way. Yeah, um, no, I mean, I think, uh, you know, you're angry because you've been been hurt um, and betrayed yeah. uh, in, in important ways. Your trust, yeah, your trust I, I think has he been like, betrayed, he's, he your, like, your yeah. friendship has been betrayed, and, you know, you've been uh, sexualized and, and romanticized um, in ways that, um, that are really ab ab abusive to you, ultimately. And um, and it's not it's not fair. It's not right. And it's OK to be angry. I think that um, I think sometimes uh, we feel guilty about about being angry and mm -hmm. that that just like worsens the spiral of it. So maybe there's some comfort in knowing that it's OK to be angry, that in fact, like I think anger is probably the appropriate um, emotional reaction there. And and then just to create the distance that you need to to be well, but it's a, it's a huge betrayal and a, and a big loss. Yeah. And, and likely the cause of that is his, like some, some internal problems that he has, and it is completely possible to, you know, be a good guy otherwise and have also, you know, real issues that are very, you know, very problematic. And, and that he, you know, at this point probably will never be able to deal with fully. Um, and that's, uh, you know, like it's and like, yeah, I mean, you, this person intentionally sacrificed a good a good relationship for um, in his own weakness. And uh, and it's very difficult to see that uh, that weakness in someone who is, you know, much more powerful, much older. And and, you know, and so the, the result is just the sort of like deep uh like how could this have happened kind of feeling and and also like oftentimes and i don't know this doesn't seem like it's it's the case in your situation but it, it could be that somehow you are responsible for that but you are not um 
Yeah. Yeah. That's really important to emphasize. And also that like, there is no such thing, at least in my opinion, I feel pretty strongly about this as a healthy romantic relationship between a 17 year old and a 60 year old, because the power dynamic can never be yeah. equal. Especially if that person is a former teacher, like in every way, this is clearly a, the wrong yeah. thing to have happened. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm just yeah. really sorry. But I think I think you've handled it well. All right, Hank, let's move on to another question uh, and just try to see if we can uh, continue this hilarious comedy podcast. Dear John <laughs> and Hank, um, this might be the least funny episode of our comedy podcast ever, which is really saying something, not least because we haven't really talked about death yet. Let's, let's try and work it in. Uh, uh, well, I will try to work death into uh, into this question, actually, because I think I think it's almost impossible, to be honest with you, I think it's almost impossible to answer this question without talking about death so that might be why it's an appealing question to me okay okay you ready yep this question comes from maya who asks dear john and hank i recently took a shower with another person for the first time and i very much enjoyed the experience and everything turned out fine even though this was a rather spontaneous <laughs> event i did find some time to worry about it which left me wondering why do farts smell so much worse in the shower with love, Maya. Maya even heroically included her last name, but I'm not going to read it uh, in case her parents listen to this podcast. <laughs> uh, well, yes. Maya, I'm glad that you asked this question about why farts smell worse in the shower, especially when you're in the shower with mm -hmm. someone else. The answer is that there are trillions of bacteria no. inside no. of your no. body no. and they no. are dying and eating no, no, and no, as no, they no. die and eat no. they make Stop. scent <laughs> and that scent comes out as well, false okay. okay but that's not the, the question and in fact john i think you actually do know the answer to this question because you wrote about it in i believe an abundance of catherine's i mean i wrote that book like 10 years ago i have no memory of it <laughs> Uh, is is that is is that the I, I apologize for having done this to you right now, but that's the one with Colin, who is who is the uh, the, the child prodigy. Yes, right? that's the one about the child prodigy. Okay, well he he says. I do it, remember. I do remember its basic subject matter. Okay, uh, it, uh, there's a uh, there's a, a scene in that book where they where uh, they talk about how when your shower turns on, the shower curtain gets sucked toward you, but that seems like the wrong thing, right? It seems like the shower should turn on and it should push the air out, and the shower curtain shouldn't try and touch you with its cold sliminess, right? You remember this part of the book? I do. Uh, so I, what, what happens is, and Colin knows the answer to this, it's Quint. Colin? Colin? Is that right? Colin. Okay, good. I'm glad I remembered his name. Uh, there's, it creates an air current inside of the shower uh, that's kind of like this like weird sort of heat uh, and, and uh, humidity tornado that is happening around you. And, uh, and mm -hmm. that uh, brings air into the shower and in toward the middle of the shower in particular. And mm -hmm. what's happening is uh, all of the air that's in the shower is sort of like being rushed around your face and it's being taken uh, from all around you and, and sort of brought up and out um, in, uh, yeah. in, in this convection current in your shower. And, and what's happening is your fart smell is just being brought much more quickly up to your nose without being dispersed very much. You're also, of course, in an enclosed container when you're in a shower, which it is... Could have been, it could have been the partner's fart smell. We don't... That wasn't well, really clarified. Well, I don't, clarified, I don't know that... Yeah, I don't... somebody's fart smell. The point is somebody's, <laughs> you know, the sort of the remnants of the, the dead and dying mm -hmm. and eating oh, bacteria stop. that this colonize is... your body as being forced into your face. Yeah, right. Well, I think I, my, my read of this question was that Maya is, is worrying about a, a future potential problem rather than uh, an actual occurrence in the, the first lovely experience of, of partner showering. Oh, maybe. I don't know. I assume yeah. that like it was like a sweet, funny thing that happened and they were able to like laugh it off because, you know, we're having our first shower, etc. cetera. Uh, well, I, 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 either way. Uh, I, I do believe that that is... I'm just, you know what? I'm just happy that somebody is in it, apparently um, a, a happy <laughs> <Yeah>. relationship. <laughs> it can happen. Or just real close friends, you know. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah or, right. But that's still a relationship, whether it's <laughs> yeah, romantic yeah, yeah. or not, is of less concern to me than oh. just it being like highly functional. Well, John, uh, this podcast is brought to you by non-romantic partner shower farts. <laughs> Non-romantic shower farts. Uh, it's a little 
little embarrassing, but mostly just fun. And of course, this podcast is brought to you by the news from AFC Wimbledon. The news from AFC Wimbledon. Oh, God. I can't believe that I still don't get to talk about it yet. And of course, this podcast is brought to you by all those suckers who don't cheat in college. What are they thinking? Paying money? <laughs> uh, learning? Come on. And finally, this podcast is brought to you by regular Subway mayonnaise. Regular Subway mayonnaise containing more calories and fat than bread. <laughs> Like the whole sandwich bread. <laughs> it's so good. It's delicious, John. I love it. I love it. I love it. I just, I hate mayonnaise. I, there is no, other than pickles, there is no sort of broadly available American food I find more reprehensible than American mayonnaise. <laughs> oh, my God. I, uh, I disagree. Uh, it is the best. It is the best. It is disgusting. It is. It, it always looks to me like some kind of industrial lubricant, you know, like it's used to make ball bearings work properly. Yeah, I do think it's, it's color. It's, a, it's sort of off-white, yellowish color is a, is a problem for mayonnaise. I, I think it's a branding issue. <laughs> and uh, if it were more like ranch dressing, which is sort of white with fun speckles, that would, be, that would be better for mayonnaise. But in the end, I think that mayonnaise, it has a rich history and a rich flavor, and I'm, I'm 100% on the mayonnaise boat. Emphasis on the rich, for sure. <laughs> um, this hey, podcast is brought to you by the mayonnaise boat. Uh, <laughs> it's a boat made of mayonnaise. This podcast is also brought to you by our supporters on Patreon. If you want to go to patreon.com slash dearhankandjohn, you can join the community there. Uh, whether or not you give us money, it, there, there uh, is stuff there for you. Uh, but also, you can give us a buck or something uh, to help us pay for our intern and our editor, and they would appreciate it. Uh, also, we just got this question from Josh, who writes, Dear John and Hank, is it possible to purchase a Dear Hank and John t-shirt? Heck yes, it is, Josh, at DFTBA.com. You can get an Oh My God, It's Burning shirt, which reminds me, Oh My God, It's Burning. Well done, John. Well done. We have another question. This one's from Ryan. And Ryan says, Dear Hank and John, my name is Ryan, and I'm fortunate enough to live a pretty comfortable lifestyle. By the way. Wait, wait, wait. What's, what's his name? By the way, my name is Ryan. Uh, so I, I, it's the 17th time you've said that his name is Ryan in the course of 12 seconds. So I've recently started to attend a new university, um, and my new friends who call me Ryan are not as fortunate as me. <laughs> <clears throat> One of my friends told me, I, I don't know why, Hank, I don't know why that joke got me so much, <laughs> but it got me so much. Oh my God. <clears throat> One of my friends told me, oh God. One of my friends said to me, Ryan, I can't afford groceries this week, Ryan. <laughs> Just keep doing it. It doesn't stop being funny for me. It's like a sine wave. It's like every time I think that I've heard enough rhymes, another one comes and I just, I'm like, I'm literally in tears. So I, Ryan, offered to pay for her groceries and she got mad at me, uh, who is Ryan, for suggesting that, for suggesting that and now won't even talk to Ryan anymore. I've had other similar experiences when trying to help my friends out. Am I wrong for trying to help my friends out financially? I just want to help them. Love, Ryan, who is Ryan. Ryan. <laughs> I like your podcast. I'm my name sorry is Ryan. to laugh at what is not, not a funny it's question. It's not a super funny question. Um, it's also not like, you know, it's, it's not the heaviest one we've dealt with this episode, though. So if we're going to make a joke during true. one question, here's what I would say. Well this one. Here's what I would say, Ryan. <laughs> um, Ryan, I think that you are trying uh, to be nice and helpful. Would you say, John Wayne? Would you people... would you say would you say he's trying? <laughs> <laughs> Catherine doesn't like this. She's making a face. <laughs> I would say I would say Ryan that you are trying uh, to be nice and helpful. But when lots and lots of people tell you that you are not being nice or helpful, it is important to listen to them, mm -hmm. um, right? So if I am, it, it, I think probably uh, it ultimately isn't helpful to them to be constantly reminded uh, that at a moment's notice, you could help out with small problems they may have like groceries because probably the big financial problems that they have, while they wouldn't be big financial problems for you, are things that, you know, you can't easily solve for them, like tens of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. of college debt or whatever. So in my experience, you know, if someone asks for help, that's one thing. Um, but I would wait until they ask. 
Right. I mean, it, it's so hard to understand how weird money is in our society, uh, and and it, yeah, you know, and, and what a gigantic uh, divider it is among us. I would say to be conscious of your friends' uh, economic positions and like don't like if you if you know that your friends are having problem like paying for groceries, don't be like let's go out to have drinks. Uh, you know, right. Find ways to like host at your house or at their, yeah, you, like you yeah. can do nice things for these people and, uh, and you can talk to them and, and like, and help them with, with their issues. But, um, and, and also like, don't loan them money to be clear. Giving money to a friend is always better than loaning money to a friend because then you're setting yourself up for a really weird power dynamic. If you're sort of always expecting the money to come back to you. Uh, but, yeah. uh, but you know, I, I, uh, you know, if a, if a friend is in a, seriously bad situation and uh and and they need help it is willing it is, it is worth maybe having a serious conversation with them but this isn't a little thing when you're just like start to you know front your friend's cash all the time um and and like you know understanding the position that you are in can be very confusing to people who have never been in your situation just like uh just like you are going to not fully understand what it's like to be in their situation so I, I applaud you for wanting to help out, uh, but I, it is surprising how weird this all is, and you have to be careful uh, because it's it's our weirdest thing. I think we are we are we are. Mm, I don't know if I don't know if money is our weirdest thing. You know what I think is our weirdest <laughs> What's thing? What's our weirdest thing? At any moment, uh, completely without cause or explanation, your entire existence can be snuffed out. <laughs> Oh, good. Glad we got there. That is, you're right. I think that is our weirdest thing, John. All right, Hank, before we get to the news from AFC Wimbledon and Mars, but mostly from AFC Wimbledon, I am so excited. We have one update uh, from Katie, who writes, uh, Dear John and Hank, I love the podcast. Been listening since the very first one. Thank you, Katie. Lots of people say that, but only you mean it. Uh, I know several times you've discussed <laughs> the issue of the human microbiome. It is one of my passions, and how bacteria can outnumber our cells by several times, or at least are a comparable number. However, Hank did bring up that they are normally very small, and this didn't seem to sway John, since he still considers himself to be half bacteria. I don't consider myself to be half bacteria. I am factually half bacteria. So I pose this question to you, John. Do you consider a cupcake with one sprinkle to be equal parts cupcake and sprinkle? Do you consider a cupcake with even a couple sprinkles to be, e to be overwhelmingly sprinkle? Human and bacterial cells are similar in size relationally to a cupcake and a sprinkle. Is it not then possible to see that you are in fact not overwhelmingly bacteria? And plus, they're only really isolated to your mucous membranes and skin. Most of your inside is sterile. Most of my inside... What are you saying about some of my inside, Katie? <laughs> well, a great deal of your inside is covered in bacteria, as previously discussed. Uh, yeah, I mean, lot, lots of my stomach has bacteria crawling all over it. Uh, the question, uh, would I consider a cupcake with one sprinkle to be equal parts cupcake and sprinkle? The answer to that is yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, th uh, I, I think uh, without the context of our current conversation, maybe you would have had a different take on that. But I understand you sticking to your guns, John, because uh, you're a stubborn dude. I am a, I am a man who passionately believes that he is half bacteria <laughs> and there is no talking me out of it. <laughs> All right, John. Uh, uh, let's let's do the news from Mars. Hank, what's the news from Mars? 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 <laughs> okay. Uh, well, the news from Mars. Make it fast. Make it fast. Make it fast. <laughs> we, we've got a uh, we've got a science spat going on in the Mars community right now. Neil deGrasse Tyson and uh, Elon Musk are having a bit of a of a tiff. Uh, mostly, it's Neil deGrasse Tyson and Elon Musk ignoring it. But uh, <laughs> Neil thinks that it's uh, ludicrous that SpaceX is going to lead the space frontier. He, in fact, calls it uh, a delusion and, uh, and says that it's just not going to happen because the U.S. government and, or governments have much more long-term views of these things and can afford to invest over decades to make one thing happen, whereas private sector is much, much worse at those kinds of things. People have different takes on this, of course, and, and in the Mars community it has been uh, quite a, a little bit of a, a fracas, I believe is a word that means what I mean. And uh, Elon Musk's take, on the other hand, is just to ignore the whole thing and continue to uh, just make billions of dollars. <laughs> right. Oh, it's hard out there for Elon Musk. <laughs> Sometimes he has to mute Neil deGrasse Tyson on Twitter. <laughs> 
All right, John, I made it as quick as I could so that you could get to the AFC Wimbledon news, which I agree is pretty, pretty cool. Uh, this week, it was announced that the AFC Wimbledon story... Could, could, do you want to first... Do you, do you, do you want to first... Uh, tell us how they're doing in the table. Just like, just a quick overview uh, of how things are going. Not, not good. Uh, yeah. Okay. A- AFC Wimbledon have dropped to 10th in League 2, uh, having lost okay. a critical game against Hartlepool, 1-0, um, and are now mm. unlikely to reach the playoffs. But there's eight games to go, and, um, you know, hope is the thing with feathers, etc. Um for instance, if you told me three months ago that I was going to get to announce this news today, I wouldn't have believed you. So who knows? The future is unpredictable. That's what makes it so amazing and terrible. <laughs> um, uh, this week it was announced that uh, the AFC Wimbledon story will be told in movie form. This is amazing. Uh, in a movie to be made by Fox 2000 Studios, produced by uh, Wick and Isaac at Temple Hill and by Rosiana and me at, we don't have a name for our production company, but. Uh, <laughs> this is amazing. So, I mean, like, you, I know. you've told I, you've told the story of AFC I Wimbledon know. many times. In fact, it, it appears sometimes to me that you tell it every single time you do the news because you gotta, you gotta make it seem interesting. But you have not told it in the true, full, exciting, built into a narrative movie way. And I love, I love sports movies. I don't like sports, but I love sports movies. They just get me so excited. I always cry. I, yeah. I, oh, you're gonna so, cry. You're gonna cry I'm when so Danny Kedwell goes up to take that critical penalty. Don't, don't spoil it for me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I am so excited <laughs> about this. This is something that I've wanted to do, of course, for uh, ever since I got a production deal with Fox. Um, and so I pitched the idea to them. Uh, I told them the AFC Wimbledon story, you know, just um, a, a small group of really middle aged people who had this community institution that they love taken away from them and responded to that, not with hopelessness or despair, but with a strange and beautiful commitment uh, to restart it, even if that meant being in the ninth tier of English football, even if that meant, you know, <laughs> sitting on hay bales to watch games, um, and uh, even if it meant having public, you know, public tryouts in a park with no uniforms or coaches or anything. Uh, and then they built it up in just nine years all the way to a football league team uh, that's a full-time professional club again. It is an amazing story about how people... Um, who have a shared commitment um, in in what in the time that we often associate with midlife crises can instead like find real meaning in their lives and and a real community uh, and kind of have a have a new a new life in a way um, and AFC Wimbledon got to have that new life and and so did the people who are at the center of the story I'm so excited about this I mean obviously there's a long long way to go like. Uh, They've got to hire a writer and then find a screenplay that they like and then find a director. It's just it's an incredibly long process. Things often go um, go haywire, but it's just so exciting. Like I I just think I I really believe that the story of this uh, this club and the nine years uh, that that these guys spent together um, building it, I should say uh, guys and women spent together uh, building it. Uh, is an amazing, it's just an amazing story. And the more like you dig into the details, the more amazing it becomes. Uh, and I think, you know, that moment of getting back into the football league on a penalty shootout with your 37 year old captain, who's never played a game of professional football in his life, uh, getting mm-hmm. into the football league in the most dramatic way possible. It's just a great, <laughs> it's a great story. I'm so excited. I've, I, I can't, I mean, I am so freaking excited uh, for the, for the prospect of an AFC Wimbledon movie. And I know it's a little bit of a weird movie to be the first uh, one that we produce with our still unnamed production company, but it also isn't because, you know, we like heartfelt stories about real people. Um, and, uh, and this is that. So I think it's, I think it's a, I think it's a great story. I think it's going to make a great movie. I agree. Uh, I'm so excited that when you first told me that you were thinking about, you know, pitching this, uh, it seemed kind of like a no-brainer to me because it's it's just it's it's a great story and it's not a super expensive one to tell. Uh, it seems right up Fox yeah. Fox 2000's alley. Um, and uh, and I, you know, like I, I mean, I think the movie is going to do very well in South London. <laughs> it's going to uh, kill it in South London. <laughs> 
we're gonna i mean i don't know if we'll be the number one movie in america but we'll definitely be the number one movie in south london um no i think you know the other thing is that there's soccer fandom is growing around the world but especially in the u.s and um and i think learning uh about the history of one club and and how it's looked uh how how you know what makes english football special which i think afc wimbledon really captures what makes um english football so special and makes the football pyramid so special um i think i think it'll excite american fans too so uh and it's it's a heartwarming love story really it's a love story about these these people who loved their club and love each other but it's also there's also you know some romantic love stories in it um so it's going to be, it's going to have something for everybody. It's have something for everybody. I'm very excited. Do you have any idea like what the timeline is on something like this? I have no idea what the timeline is. Sometimes things happen in like two years, uh, like it did with the Paper Towns movie. Sometimes uh, 11 years later, like with the Looking for Alaska movie, it's just uh, two people who no longer speak to each other. <laughs> 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 so you never know how it's going to go. <laughs> All right, John, what did we learn today? Oh, we learned that the AFC Wimbledon movie is going to be the greatest thing ever. We learned that John Green has a lot of thoughts on Keynesian economics and how uh, the viewpoints of it have been reinforced by the economic stimulus plan of 2009 that is oh, called I'm going to catch so much flack from the from America a, a, is better recovery act.com. Uh, I am going to catch a lot of flack for what I said about Keynesian economics from the Austrians out there. Um, <laughs> not the people in, in in Austria, the people who ascribe to the Austrian school of economics. Ah, I see. Uh, I do not know. Th- I do not know. Um, what else did we learn? Uh, we learned that there's something with Mars, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, going to Mars, <laughs> private enterprise, public funds, uh, AFC Wimbledon movie. I can't remember. We learned something about Mars. Uh, yes, AFC Wimbledon movie, something about Mars. And we learned, uh, you know, and also, <clears throat> and also, John, a young man named Ryan taught us that Ryan's name is Ryan. <laughs> The main thing we learned is that <laughs> is is that Ryan's name is Ryan. Hey, can I tell you a quick story that probably shouldn't be included in the podcast? Yeah, okay. All right. So, uh, for some reason, there was a fact recently in a mental floss video that caused me to laugh so uproariously that we had to briefly cancel this shoot. And this was the fact that in 2006, um, a New Zealand man uh, tried to sell Australia on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I mean there are so many good facts on mental floss i don't know why that's the one I, it's just every detail of that fact every <laughs> detail of that fact is just so beautiful i could just picture oh. the new zealand man like putting together all of his pictures of australia to use in the ebay listing <laughs> all right thank you for the story john uh and uh And thank you, listener, for listening to our podcast. If you were watching it, that's super creepy. How are you both in L.A. and and Indianapolis at the same time? And which of these windows are you looking at? There's a lot of windows in this house. Uh, But thanks for listening. uh, and, And thank you, John, for joining me. Yes, our podcast is edited by Nicholas Jenkins. Our intern is Claudia Morales. We're very grateful to Rosiana Hals Rojas for her help in uh, gathering questions. You can email us at hankandjohn at gmail.com or use the hashtag uh, Dear Hank and John on Twitter or snap us on Snapchat. I'm John Green Snaps or John Green Snaps, depending on how you read it. Hank is Hank G R E. Gunnarola is responsible for our theme music. Uh, John is responsible for all of our thoughts of morbidity and I am responsible for basically attempting to carry this entire thing on on the weight of of my own shoulders because everyone knows that John's bad at stuff. And as they say in our hometown, (laughs) don't don't forget forget to be be awesome. awesome. (laughs) I'm not going to give you a chance to respond. (laughs) Ha 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 ha.